recording now ish there it is great um so wonderful to be back with our host daniel ryan and his guest tonight a very special guest who has also led his own webinars here at the lab before alexandra tanus um i will let daniel introduce alexandra and his work but the title for this evening's webinar session is Guided Healing Through Voice and Sound, of which Alexandra is definitely an expert. So we're very much looking forward to the dialogue that you're going to bring to the table with this topic, Daniel, tonight, just in the, um, in the field of, of, of your work. It's going mm. to be very interesting. Mm. Um, and I'll just second Kelly by saying, please feel free, everybody out there, to um, post your comments throughout the, the hour. I can come back to them at the end. Um, I have to be questions. I can just put your, your comments, thoughts or experiences to Dan and Alexandra as well. So, and um, I definitely encourage you all to come on the mic and camera so that we can all participate. Um, and with that, uh, with, with that, I will pass it <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you very much, Henrietta. And welcome back, everybody. Good evening. I'm very excited to be speaking with Alexandra Tanaus this evening. Uh, and just to say a little bit about him up top, uh, Alexandra's research is an in investigation into the therapeutic and esoteric properties of sound from three different perspectives, Western scientific, Eastern philosophical, and shamanic societal beliefs. He has sought to gain a deeper understanding of how and to what extent sound has been used to affect human consciousness. As an ethnomusicologist, his approach entails the social scientific study of sound used in several traditional contexts, such as religious, spiritual, holistic, and cultural. For various purposes and occasions in entertainment, worship, meditation, and rituals of healing and trance. Consequently, his approach in research researching, understanding, experiencing, and transmitting sound has always been based on a multidisciplinary approach. On a personal note, my introduction to Alexandra's work began when I was listening to a podcast called Midwest Real, which is a uh, philosophy podcast, which Alexandra was being interviewed for. And I think I found it through a post on a friend of mine's Facebook page. He and I had played together in bands a decade ago and still get together and play music uh, every once in a while. And I have a personal history as a musician and using my voice as a hypnotherapist have long been deeply interested in just exactly how the sound I was making was affecting the people that I was working with as a hypnotherapist, but then also going back to my personal history with audio as a musician. So when I heard this podcast and Alexander just started to uh, <laughs> discuss his research and his background. I was immediately blown away and kind of infatuated with his work early on. And that led me uh, to his TED Talk, which we will include a link to here, as well as Alexander's work with Evolver, the webinar series that he's done previously. Um, so I am very excited and very honored to be speaking with Alexander Tanaus. Thank you. Welcome, Alexander. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Daniel. With pleasure and honor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so to begin our conversation tonight, uh, would you please tell us a little bit about your introduction to your work and how you got started in your field and the, the foundations of your passions for working with sound? Yeah. Um, well, I'll try to keep it short because hmm. it's long and fascinating and convoluted <laughs> and I just didn't know I was gonna get here I didn't see it coming actually uh, I've been studying music since uh, I was a kid and um, and I went to college and did 12 years of um, training in music did four different degrees all in music um, I was really fascinated by various aspects of uh, music making and academic side of music, uh, studied theory, composition, and performed a lot uh, classical jazz and other uh, musical cultures. 
in non-Western as well. Mm. And uh, studied music education, ethnomusicology, uh, studied conducting as well. And I was interested in all these aspects. But um, we, this can happen in other fields, but especially in music, when you start to know so much about music, um, you have a lot of questions that mm. are being answered, they get answered, but also you start to have more questions, which lead to so many other esoteric things that um, no one was addressing. Universities, conservatories were not teaching and um, bringing awareness to. So I, I, a lot of these things emerged during my field work, um, which um, I augmented and started giving it a different shape based on my inquiries. And uh, I started this independent study on uh, sound, the therapeutic and esoteric properties of sound, and really in investigating how sound impacts consciousness and how sound has been used. And that changed my life. And it's been going on for 11 years now. Mm. I don't do anything other than doing sound research and practicing as sound therapist and talking, lecturing uh, about sound and transmitting this knowledge which um, so far uh, has been obscured to so, so many people and it's mm. kind of lost knowledge. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, you and I have spoken a little bit previously about uh, the voice as a healing tool in hypnotherapy and past life regression. And we've also mentioned just how many cans of worms there are possible to open up and come across in going into this subject and just how deep it is. Uh, aware of that and wanting to stay as focused as we can, can you tell us a little bit, give us a foundation for how you uh, see the power of the voice in guiding therapy and guiding meditation or in guiding past life regression, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, this is a topic that is very, very rich. And uh, any time one attempts to talk about sound, as you mentioned, there are a lot of cans of worms. And, and uh, I always start by telling people when I'm giving a presentation that um, the magic in sound is in its details and depth and in a multidisciplinary approach. And uh, one cannot really water down this information, reduce it to a uh, basic form. And if one is giving a talk about sound, when I, I usually do this, I always tell people that the material is very dense, abstruse, and it's not to be reduced. And I also tell people that it's okay to get only 90%, 70%, 50%, 40%, 30%. Uh, it's all right. Um, it's not meant to be reduced, but gaining deeper insights and doing additional homework and gain, getting frequent exposure to this material would certainly help. We're not going to go this deep right now. This is mm. a slightly different topic. Mm -hmm. It's not going to involve sound. But um, why? Uh, well, sound has a wide variety of different uses and has been involved um, for who knows how long in so many rituals, all sorts of rituals, uh, spiritual rituals or religious, sacred shamanic, holistic, and it's involved now in our life in more ways than one. But when it comes to speech, and uh, especially in the context of guiding someone mm. um, in form of therapy or past life regression or hypnosis, it's very important to think of the voice as an instrument because it is the ultimate instrument that all instruments try to imitate in all cultures, no instrument is as versatile as the human voice mm. for a wide variety of different reasons. For first of all, the range, the voice has a very wide range spanning three to five octaves sometimes mm. <clears throat> with professional singers. The voice is very expressive, has a wide range of different amplitudes, softness and loudness. 
and most importantly um, has an emotional capacity the voice can mm -hmm. uh, be a vehicle to a lot of emotions that um, are not so easy to portray when we're playing an instrument mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you uh, yeah you're welcome in my training as a hypnotherapist, I was taught a great deal about pacing and rhythm and tone and how subtle the effects of changing pace, speech, and things like this, how they have such an effect non-verbally in the physiology and in the interaction that happens between people consciously and unconsciously. Mm -hmm. um, so as we talk about the effects of sound on consciousness, uh, would you say a little bit about these aspects of speech and how they relate particularly to trance and healing, adjusting mm -hmm. pitch, adjusting tone, things like this, these subtler effects? Yeah. Yeah, well, um, this, is, this is a fascinating area. Um, there's a lot more in a dialogue than people think people mm. tend to focus more on the words well mm. yes the words are very important and body language is important mm. and electromagnetics also are very important but that's something we, we can witness in in person mm. referring to the latter <clears throat> but um there are so many things embedded in in the voice in speech that we don't think of them directly but they do affect us even when we're not aware of them um, and uh, you're actually, <laughs> I, can, I can hear in the way you're speaking um, that you're very aware of them, but in a natural way. Mm. So I'm going to expand on these mm. a bit. Um, so first of all, you have the inflections and the intonations. The inflections are basically these small embedded melodies that we have in speech. And they vary from one language to another. Uh, take, for example, the Romance languages, uh, French, Italian, and Spanish. A lot of people know that uh, they tend to sound very melodic and uh, euphonous and um, has a certain sing-songy effect to them um, mm -hmm. compared to other languages. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, that's true, but if we were to think and analyze why are they so melodic? What makes them melodic? We'll realize that because of these small fragments, the melodic segments that are within the speech, within the language, um, the highs and the lows, we call these tonal inflections or inflections. Some people call them intonation, uh, but the more correct word is inflections. Mm. They're the little highs and the lows. Mm -hmm. I just said one. The little highs and the lows. Da -da 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 -da. That's the melody basically that I sang using yeah. this sentence. Yeah. So um, these are very important in speech because they communicate the emotional state of the person. Not all the time, but most of the time they do, especially in critical phrases. Um, they indicate how the person is feeling when one is saying such a sentence, what is the person trying to convey along with conveying the words, the phrases? Because they could be in attitude, emotions, feelings, intentions. All of these things are included in the musical aspect of a phrase. And the musical aspect is very, very important. We respond to it in an automatic way we are hardwired to understand and be attuned to uh, music as a medium. Uh, we can go into the science, but we may get this later, but let me, uh, it's better to address everything there is to be addressed in, in speech uh, first. So inflections are very important. And uh, the silence between the words, that's also another important aspect that creates emphasis on specific words and mm. cadences. Cadences are the ending of a phrase or a musical phrase or verbal phrase. And this ending can be final, semi-final. All of these things are found in music and they have specific terms for them. So certain cadences can leave you hanging 
just like this one. <laughs> and certain phrases can be final. So you know from the melody that I reached the end of a phrase. Yeah. By the way I ascend and leave things hanging and descend coming back to home base or yeah. full cadence. Um, so um, the silence between the words creates an emphasis on specific um, segments. Uh, and also the articulation, the enunciation, uh, these are also important. Of course, it's always good to articulate well in all phrases, in all speech, but sometimes people make a point to articulate so well to bring an emphasis to a word that they're, they want to draw attention to. Mm. Um, and then, um, so basically there is a monotony as well. Sometimes if people talk in a uh, monotonous tone, they're trying to express something. Could be boredom or could be annoyance or could be irritability mm. um, and many other things. Mm -hmm. And uh, so would that means they're trying to be less emotional than the usual. Mm. And hopefully everyone becomes more aware of these musical aspects. Usually people who do a lot of speeches, presentations, uh, public speaking, teachers, um, officials of all sorts, uh, therapists mm. um, are aware of speech. Uh, news presenters, of course, they're trained tremendously mm -hmm. how to capture the attention. And when it comes to that, there's also the physical gestures. They don't talk in a way where they're just barely moving uh, their body or their hand, but sometimes they make a point to move the entire body to keep the viewers fully engaged. You know, you've mm -hmm. seen that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a little, little too much. <laughs> um, so... Um, physical uh, the physical aspect the body language can go hand in hand with the musical aspect of, of speech as well mm -hmm. and then you have the register uh, which is which register to use in the speech the very high voice or the very low voice mm -hmm. uh, or the balance in between or undulating and going in a linear way where one tries not to cause monotony by staying within the same vocal range mm -hmm. uh, or specific um, interval. Uh, interval is a distance between one note and another note. So something, for example, that is limited to a fourth, which is the distance between <clears throat> one note, let's say the note is C and the next note is F, that's a fourth. C, D, E, F, da, bum. If, if I were to stay within this range, that would be somewhat monotonous. It's better to undulate to the higher and the lower register mm. to keep things flowing. And this musical aspect um, would allow the listener not to get bored, to keep mm. the person captivated and present. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, there could be... Um, uh, the tempo, the speech tempo, the speech tempo, the speed rate, and the way it fluctuates as well. Mm. So um, sometimes, usually, when people are busy, want to try to get things done quickly, uh, if they're stressed out, they usually speak in a high rate, high, mm -hmm. fast tempo. Um, that does not always grant attention. People kind of um, but listen to it and it washes over them and they don't take it seriously. They don't capture everything. And this is why when we want to be serious, want to communicate that we're being serious, we slow down and we emphasize everything. And this is where <clears throat> uh, certain stress on words can, can come in, in the articulation and how things are stressed. Uh, the syllables, the vowels, the consonants, just to convey certain seriousness and certain uh, command. Hmm. 
so all of these so far are uh, aspects of music that are considered to be part of the characteristics of music. Mm-hmm. Um, and also there is, uh, um, there are other things that are not directly related to music, but they're also interesting to pay attention to in words, uh, such as the redundancy in words and in actions and, and also um, the amount of filler words in speech. Um, they're, uh, well, that's, I mean, they're sometimes called speech uh, disfluency. <laughs> mm. uh, the ah, uh, the o, oh, and um, you know, mm-hmm. uh, actually, basically, uh, just really, really, really little, <laughs> <laughs> kind of, sort of, you know, uh, mm. uh, like, yeah, that's, that's a big one. Like, that's a big one. Yeah, I'm sure, we both know a lot of people who say like after every two, three words. So these are filler words and it's very important to become aware of them. Mm -hmm. They're becoming more and more uh, used without the awareness and it makes me wonder why, why are people saying, using a lot of filler words without realizing that they're, they're really not needed. Mm. I just said one, they're really not needed. I can skip, for example, really, they're not needed. So if, if I say one, no, I'm not saying don't say any of them. <laughs> no, it's all right. But using them excessively, that sometimes I count with certain people over 20 likes a minute. So um, that can cause a certain reaction, certain judgment in certain people. Mm. So these are not directly related to the musical aspect, but these are things that are in speech and we must address them and understand them. Why are they there? Why are they not there? Just like the melodic aspect, the musical aspect that is in speech as well. Hmm. So when I talk about uh, music, let's call it music in, in speech, uh, I also address these filler words and uh, speech deflu- disfluency and uh, any redundancy, redundancy uh, to create more self-awareness. That's the whole point. So I'm coming from a good place. The more we're aware, we have self-awareness of how our emotions, thoughts, feelings are being conveyed through what we call speech, the more enhanced the communication becomes. And the more we are aware what doesn't need to be there, the more effective we are at conveying truly. Because really, our voice is the most important sense. You know, when, because it tells the people around us how we're feeling, Mm -hmm. what are we thinking about, what our intentions are. Mm -hmm. even in listening like you're doing it in a superb way you Mm -hmm. are communicating listening through these agreements Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know these are very important they can be um, accompanied by a physical gesture a head nod or a specific look or you know movement in in the head the body the torso the hands Mm -hmm. these are very very important aspects of speech that we heavily rely on because they enhance the connection between two people so Mm -hmm. it's not just words so there are various things there's also the the dynamics the the amplitude the softness and the loudness in in speech and how it changes how it fluctuates so there are really uh, various aspects um, within the speech that we need to bring awareness to, especially these days where technology has become an essential component of our consciousness. Mm -hmm. So many of the things that we do are via technology, emails, texting, uh, social media, and all of these musical aspects are missing. This is the biggest danger and people are not aware. 
So what do we do? We invent emoticons. Oh, okay, that solves the problem. <laughs> emoticons are not going to replace all the musical aspects in speech. You know, mm. just squeezing in a smiley face or a sad face or a wink. That, that's not going to do it. So you can imagine how much we're missing out mm. now that we use so much emails and they're very practical. I'm not saying don't use email, but how many people call other people on the phone? Mm. Texting is the thing. And sometimes we end up putting more time into texting than as if we were to pick up the phone and call and have two minute conversation. Indeed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, so many people do that. And sometimes it gets annoying, like spending 20 minutes texting back and forth with, with some couple of minutes of intervals of silence and then then another text like you're doing other things you're constantly being interrupted like ah. then makes me think you know why mm -hmm. this person didn't call is it easier to just talk one minute on the phone why because there's a dialogue because there's the musical aspect there's all of these things that can can be but when we read the text or an email text in general we can go uh, wrong. We can misunderstand things because when we read text, we're reading it and the only option there is how I understand it, how I fill in the blank, given that there is no musical aspect to that. Mm. So this is where misunderstandings uh, accrue, right? I mean, mm -hmm. very often we read the text that can be uh, read or communicated in several different ways depending on how it's being sung. Mm -hmm. Literally, it comes down to this. Mm -hmm. How it's being sung. Not necessarily sung, like, but what are the musical aspects that are in it? And that's not in text. That's never in text. Mm -hmm. You know, there's an art to reading poetry. Mm -hmm. That art yeah. is actually setting the poetry to music and it's an extemporaneous composition mm -hmm. yeah beautiful thank you very much you're welcome so i'd like to talk a little now about the voice as a healing tool and its use in trance in particular historically there were in ancient greece places called sleep chambers and the word hypnosis itself comes from the greek hypnos and gnosis which means sleep knowing or sleep knowledge mm -hmm. uh, and i've read that similar uh, events in places existed in ancient egypt and in just about every civilized ancient society uh, I'm wondering if that coincides with your research and what you know about how they were using sound in ancient civilizations as a healing tool in these formative ways and, and how that may have influenced us in the present. Yeah. Um, nobody knows really how music back then sounded. There, there, mm. there are some manuscripts with very vague nebulous notation, different system of notation than the notation that we know, we mm. now know, the Guido d'Arezzo system. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, but um, if we were to take a guess, we would say that um, music in ancient Greece sounded very much like some, some of the surviving uh, uh, aspects of Greek music that has not been westernized and that would be similar to the music that's used in the Greek Orthodox Church, Byzantine chants. Uh -huh. Yeah, which yeah. are, uh, the music is microtonal. These chants are microtonal, they include notes between, that would fall between the black and the white keys on the piano. So um, Byzantine chants and ancient Greek music, uh, both are heavily influenced by Turkish and Arabic music, which remained unchanged, pretty much unchanged, a lot uh, aside from the European influence in the pop form. But here I'm referring to the classical forms. Mm -hmm. But what does this music sound like? It's microtonal, it's non-equal tempered scales. That means uh, they use scales that, are, that have not been divided into equidistant steps, the Western scale, Western octave, and scales. 
uh, both are equal tempered. Equal tempered that means they're divided into equidistant half steps. Uh, that's a little bit tricky to unfold and explain, but think of it this way that the mathematics of sound are quantized in the half steps. Mm. The octave is equal to 1200 cents. A cent is a unit for logarithmic measurement. Here's another can of worm, but I'm going to wrap it up quickly. <laughs> <coughs> People can always invest, research it online. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, just to give a little preface, uh, sound is math. Sound mm -hmm. is mathematics that we're listening to, literally. It's all mathematical ratios. Mm -hmm. An interval of a fifth, the distance between C and G, or D and A, that's called a fifth, um, is a three to two ratio. If you go from C to D, the very next note up, from white key to next white key up with a black key in the middle, or D to E, that's a second. Huh? Mm -hmm. That's a nine to eight ratio, so on and so forth. So really, sound is mathematical ratios that we're listening to. Okay, that would launch us into another barrel of worms. <laughs> Not a can, but just to tell you a little bit, and I'm going to bring things back, but here. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> you asked me. <laughs> I'm with this you. This is one of these things that, you know, it, it's, that's why it's always hard, but often fascinating to talk about sound. Yeah. Um, so I'll come back to where we started from. Basically, yes, it comes down to mathematics. Mathematics is everything. Mathematics is the source code of the universe. People think music is the universal language. Well, kind of, yes, I know what you mean, but it's mathematics and music is math. Um, recently, an academic by the name of uh, Jay Kennedy wrote a book. He's a philosopher uh, and professor of philosophy at the University of Manchester in England. Um, he wrote a book about <clears throat> uh, Plato's work, the all of Plato's work, entire, the whole thing, is all about sound and mathematical ratios. It's encoded. People think it's about philosophy. Yes, it's about philosophy, but there's an underlying structure. It's all about sound and it's mm -hmm. encoded to an extent where one would not realize that it's about sound unless one knows ancient Greek music and mm -hmm. a few other things. Now, why would he do something like this? Because Plato was a Pythagorean. Pythagoras uh, is known to be the father of geometry, but he's also someone who studied in ancient mysteries of the Hermetic schools from ancient Egypt and uh, the ancient uh, mysteries of uh, uh, Tyre in ancient Phoenicia, a city that still exists in Lebanon, and, and Byblos, another city that still exists in Le Lebanon, modern day Lebanon. They were both in what was then known is Phoenicia. Mm -hmm. And he basically um, brought this ancient lost knowledge into Europe. And he researched thoroughly and investigated over many years uh, sacred geometry, mathematical ratios, sound, and the connection to consciousness. And he had many followers. Socrates, Plato's teacher, was a Pythagorean. And Plato was a Pythagorean as well. Now, Socrates was executed because he was sowing impiety in, in the minds of young students. He was trying to awaken everybody. Mm. Because this control of consciousness and halting, suppressing consciousness is is pretty old agenda, not a new one. Right. Plato was smarter. He was his student. He encoded everything to an extent where people would not know this unless they know. And as you know, the truth cannot be given because the person has to be at the level of understanding it. And this is why a lot of far out knowledge was kept in brotherhood, secret societies, um, in occult philosophy, uh, and, and esoteric philosophies and so on because it is to be kept alive, transmitted and not to be given to everyone because people would misuse it, would lose it, would 
mistreated, not realize how important it is. Mm -hmm. So um, Plato did us a service and only now we're starting to decode it. Now, he didn't want to go blatantly tell everyone, look guys, you know, the universe is ruled by mathematical ratios and sound and not by Zeus and the gods of Olympus. Um, you know, he, they would have killed him just like they did with his teacher. Mm -hmm. So why? That's the question. Because this is the mystery of consciousness. Um, that's actually why sound music is the ultimate tool to hack consciousness, to awaken and expand consciousness. And this is why it was used in shamanic societies along with the second most powerful tool. I mean, another, I'm not gonna prioritize. Mm -hmm. If you ask me, I would say sound is much more important than the psychedelic plants that are the sacraments used in different shamanic societies because these two tools have always been the most effective tools to hack the operating system, if we can say it, mm -hmm. consciousness. And not only in shamanic societies, in ancient India, they drank soma. Soma is known to be a psychedelic potion. In ancient Greece, too, the, in the uh, Eleusinian mysteries, for a couple of thousand years, they drank the kikion, which uh, some experts believe that it's some potion contains uh, LSD-like alkaloid, which comes from a, from a fungus that grows on wheat called ergot. Mm. So basically, we can learn a lot about consciousness uh, and about gnosis, self-knowledge, mm -hmm. by using, using um, sound and compounds if they're available but sound can be pretty enough if the sound is powerful mm -hmm. if the sound is not incapacitated like the equal tempered octave in the west many ancient musical cultures still have these microtones and the non-equal temperament um, different divisions to an octave more than 12 like we have in the west uh, Indian classical music, Turkish, Arabic, uh, Persian, Armenian, Central Asian, North African, basically any culture that's not Western mm -hmm. uh, still uh, uses the, the, the non-incapacitated octave. Why? Because, and here we go back to where we started from, because reality is biocentric. Reality is to use a term that Robert Lanza, I highly encourage people to read his book, Biocentrism. Yes. About the nature of con uh, reality and the reality is a product of our consciousness. Mm -hmm. Reality seems to be a process that happens inside of us and not outside of us. A reality, we, we understand very little what reality is. So um, sound can affect so much this reality. Um, there's a great connection between language and the word. Many experts said the word exists because we have a language for it. Hmm. The um, ancient languages such as Sanskrit, ancient Greek, ancient Hebrew, Arabic, Aramaic, and other languages have power in, built in, inherent in them, in the consonants, in the vowels, in the way sentences and words are built. This is a very esoteric side of uh, language. I'm not going to delve deep into it. So mm -hmm. this is what happens when we are trying to use words, language, to change someone's consciousness, to guide them into a hypnotic state where they're not part of this consensual reality, where they're journeying into their own consciousness um, or in the astral, in the ether, I can't give you specifics. We don't have words for mm -hmm. what happens on the other side. And that's the other thing is that it's so hard to describe a uh, deep meditative state. It's hard to describe a journey. It's hard to describe any experience um, outside of this consensual reality with the language that we have. May I ask you a question about that? 
Yeah, please. Do you think that that is a problem with language itself, or do you feel that that is a problem with the modern English language? I, I agree, and, and I find that, you know, the modern English language, at the very least, is a very clunky set of tools for talking about this internal experience of reality we're all having. Yeah. Uh, so my, my question is, is it language as a whole, or is think, it the modern English? I think it's language as a whole. Uh. I, I speak five languages. I can tell you that for sure that it's not easier in other languages other than English. Okay. Everybody, everybody knows this, regardless what language they speak. Mm -hmm. um, so I think language uh, is for this reality, is for consensual reality, is for mm. wakeful reality. Mm. Um, that's why when we are trying to talk about an experience that happened in a transcendental state or a psychedelic state, for us to make that experience be described in words, we're going to have to force uh, the words to describe what happened there in as close as possible. Mm. But there will still be a lot of inaccuracies. Mm -hmm. um, so take for example, when we're dreaming, we don't need a language. There's no language there. People often ask me, oh, you speak different languages. Oh, what language do you dream in? They often ask this. Well, you know, there's no, sometimes there is language. Most of the time it's just imagery. Hmm. Imagery, it's a synesthetic state, a total synesthetic state where you are watching something, say, film-like or a dream. Mm -hmm. um, but language is not needed. Language can be there if you're having a dialogue with someone. Mm -hmm. But that's a total synesthetic state where the emotional, the mental, the visual, the linguistic, all are within one package, mm -hmm. one dimension. So it's hard to translate that into words mm. but there is certain level of synesthesia that is also very important in in the use of language for therapists uh, regardless of of the purpose <clears throat> synesthesia is the crossing of the senses mm -hmm. most of the time it's auditory to visual one out of ten people is a natural born synesthete um, so uh, and it can happen between uh, olfactory and visual or auditory and olfactory. Some people see shapes when they hear numbers. Some people see colors when they hear numbers or, or when they hear uh, specific keys, musical keys, C major, D minor, G minor, and so on. Um, some people uh, see uh, with eyes closed, they see uh, colors with um, certain instruments or scales so that's called synesthesia when the senses cross mm -hmm. um, so there seem to be connection between sound and the way we experience reality and that also happens if let's say i'm telling you something about uh, a trip that i took uh, let's say last week and i was on the beach and i throw in words like that and you're gonna briefly see beach in your mind's eye or tree or a mountain. So these things happen a lot. That's synesthesia. Mm. This happens to all of us all the time when we're talking. There's certain mm. level of the visual level that happens inside of us. Mm -hmm. Even physics, you know, cannot reconcile like, well, how reality is the way it is when there's nothing solid. It's all energy vibrating. Hmm. We used to think that atom is solid. That now we we're several steps beyond the atom. We have all these things that are within the atom, and and large distances between, you know, one particle and then it's mostly void and energy. It does not hmm. amount to this. Hmm. So, this is why uh, we need to know more about what reality is in the biocentric model is very important and I fully agree with the Robert Lanz's model uh, because this is what consciousness is and this is where language comes and the musical aspect in the language when we are using it we are taking someone into that source code mm -hmm. beyond the consensual reality a place where things are possible such as what happened in past life regression, 
Indeed. The Akashic records, yeah. these databases that yeah. exist uh, that are not easily attained. How yeah. do we get to them? Language, speech, yes, music within that. So a perfect place to ask, would you please offer some advice and some suggestions that you offer to students and practitioners on how to better use their voice and to practice and to understand their sound and how to use it as a healing tool? Yeah, uh, to listen. <laughs> Beautiful. To really listen. Yeah. It's the hardest thing to listen. Yeah. We only think we listen in an optimal way. That's something I've been learning <laughs> about for many years, mm -hmm. to listen to nuances, not just general stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to expand on this. <clears throat> to listen to ourselves when we're talking. To really pay attention to uh, how much am I taking my time to really convey accurately, succinctly, or with all of the deserved details to what I'm feeling or all the hard things that I would like to convey about something that's abstruse in a very limited time, to take time to think and not to rush into doing something. And this is why speech disfluency, these filler words are absolute toxins. Why? Because Let's say as a person is saying something of substance and then instead of taking silence, this small interval of silence to think and feel, the person's gonna throw in like, um, uh, er, whatever. That's not a silence. The person is being busy by the sound they're making mm -hmm. in two different ways. In an auditory way, the way they're hearing their voice, and a secondary way that people are not aware of, most of what we experience of our voice is through bone and tissue conduction. Mm. Um, if you want to get an example of what th that would be like, uh, block one ear or both ears and just say a few words and you'll see how your voice will change. Mm. That is basically bone and tissue conduction. This is how, why people react when they first hear um, their voice uh, in a recorded form. They right away, they right away say, that's not me doesn't sound like me. Yes, it does sound like you. This is how people hear you, not how you hear yourself. Because we hear our voice um, somewhere between 40, 50, 60 percent through bone and tissue conduction. It's a combination of two things. The auditory, the voice coming out of the mouth and coming back to the ears. And through bone and tissue conduction, how the voice travels through vibration and we feel it and hear it through feeding it in the jaws, the cheeks, the skull, the head, the neck, the chest, you know, so on. Mm -hmm. So to really think and feel how we're expressing ourselves is what I'm saying matches how I'm feeling, especially if it's very hard to express. Mm -hmm. Of course, if the person is irritated or hyped up in some way, or excited or nervous, that's going to be harder. So there, one needs a breath first. Breath through the, through the diaphragm to relax the muscles. And to really find the appropriate words, that's another thing that's happening, that we're becoming more and more sloppy with language. We're not choosing our words carefully. We're just circulating in music stuck words of, and expressions that others repeat when they don't mean a whole lot. Because it's, especially when it comes to communicating something that's hard, we end up by using a stock word or stock expression. Mm. Instead of using sound like an artistic medium to really find the right words that can paint a different reality. Because at the end, it's about painting a different reality. It's about giving someone the opportunity to experience our reality, the reality of the one who is talking about something, kind of like poetry. Mm. Yeah. And this is what singers do. This is what Billie Holiday did. The reason mm. why she was amazing as a singer, because she gave the songwriting life. 
through the way she articulated it, the way she sang it, you could hear the pain and the sadness in her voice, not just in the words, but the packaging of the words. It's this kind of attention that's needed mm -hmm. because language is an essential component of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And instead of treating it better and better and on a high level, we are becoming sloppy with it and nonchalant and skipping the musical aspect, just typing words. Mm. So um, when we're careful with, with our words and with the musical aspect and listening to them and really thinking, discerning whether I'm doing justice and comparing what's in my heart, what's in my mind with what I'm saying, I can make corrections as, I, as I'm listening and speaking. Um, I can also get more out of the meaning when I'm listening to someone else talking. You know, you can see it on people's faces as you're having a dialogue, and especially if it's a, an argument or a debate or something of any intensity. If you're watching carefully, a lot of people check out in mid, midway through that sentence that you're saying because they're already thinking how they're going to answer. You haven't even finished the sentence. Mm. And you can see it on their face, on their body language, mm. uh, waiting for you to stop to, or even they interrupt you. Like, wait, wait, listen. Listen, listening is an art. How far does it go? It goes really far. I mean, that's what the Sufis did. With their art, they called it uh, um, sama. Sama in... in um, in Arabic, uh, the language that most of them used is a uh, judicious listening. It's through spiritual listening, if you will. You can journey in the music that they listen to, which is uh, very similar to classical Arabic music, classical Turkish and classical Persian music, because Sufism came out of uh, you know the Middle East and West Asia. West Asia is comprised of these cultures, which they still exist uh, there. <clears throat> and there are different Sufi orders. But basically, they sit and they listen to the singer, the instrumentalist playing, singing that music. And then when they're ready, they stand up and little by little, they start warming up their body in gentle movement. Eventually, they whirl. But through listening, they attain a state of tarab, which in classical Arabic music is a ecstatic state, state of euphoria, of ecstasy, achieved through musical understanding, listening, and playing. Uh, that's spiritual listening. That's listening that takes you to a state of non-duality where you merge with the divine within, God. Mm -hmm. So listening is the hardest thing and the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm sorry it was a long answer, but... No, I appreciate I, it. <laughs> I couldn't do it in a shorter way, and I shouldn't do it in a... <laughs> no, way. absolutely not. And just listening to you, again, it, it's, it never stops. I mean, it's just such an endless, endless area of study, isn't it? I mean, where do you, where do you stop? Yeah, right. You know? Um, so, coming back to the formative power of sound, uh, you know, in the Bible it says, first there was the word, and in various <laughs> other philosophical... Uh, texts, there is all this indication that manifestation begins yeah. with the sound. Would you please talk about the generative power of sound? Yes. And as the starting point, as the nucleus. Yeah. Well, you know, that's the other thing is that everyone is talking about sound. Every time you go deep into any text, any heritage, any philosophy, um, esoteric or exoteric, there's always sound at the bottom of it all. Mm. Even in the Bible, people don't ask questions about that first sentence in the Gospel of John. In the beginning, there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Mm. What, is, what is being talked about? Sound. What is that word? The, the Logos, basically, comes from ancient Greece. Logos, also, mm. word. Mm -hmm. In Hinduism, um, they say the universe started with the primordial Om. Mm. Another sentence, Indra's net of jewels. Indra is the god of thunder and lightning. This is also sound. Um, music of the spheres, sound. The Big Bang, sound. 
mm -hmm. you know, and so on and so forth. So um, many of the books I mentioned earlier, Plato's work is all about sound. The Old Testament is all about sound. It's all encoded. There's always sound at the root level of everything. What is this biggest mystery? There are very few researchers. Um, a friend of mine, Howard Berrishartz, he was a guest in uh, the, the second webinar on sound therapy I gave, uh, has been researching this for over 30 years. He studied with someone, Ernst McLean. People can check out his writing and download his PDFs for free. Um, also spent his entire life researching this very esoteric aspect. You know, the answer is, I don't know. I can't tell you. Mm. What, is, what is this mystery with sound? Somehow it is a mystery, and it's really the deepest secret that's been hidden, that's been encoded, that's been discussed in esoteric philosophies, in, you know, the harmonic overtone series. That's what I've been focusing on. Mm -hmm. Harmonic overtone series is... Uh, the blueprint of sound that nature gave us. Um, and basically, well, I prepared a few slides, so maybe I can show people, because this is something Please. that's really technical to, to explain. Let me share this. Um, keynote file, so you can... Uh, what? because it's good to reinforce it with uh, some visuals. It's mm -hmm. really important. So, um, um, harmonic overtones. So basically, any sound that we listen to is not just one frequency. It's the sum of many frequencies. Um, and they're there to give any sound that we listen to um, the tone color or the timbre. Basically what differentiates your voice from my voice is the tone color or timbre. The sound of a flute from the sound of an oboe, clarinet, violin, that's timbre. And what makes that one note different from another is all these fine frequencies that we call overtones or harmonic overtones that lay above that fundamental frequency. The fundamental frequency is the most pronounced note and um, the overtones will be on top. So basically what you're looking at here is a string vibrating in uh, as a whole and then in division of two, division of three, four, five, six to infinity. Mm. If you were to break a string into division of two and lightly touch that middle part, you get the harmonic. Let's say the string when you pluck it, it gives you a C note. That harmonic that you bring out by lightly touching the string in the middle, dividing the string into two equal parts, would be an octave higher C. That's the first harmonic in the series. Mm. If you were to divide the string into three equidistant parts, you get the next harmonic, two nodes, two places where you can get the harmonic. That place is called a node. N O D E. That would be a G. That's the second harmonic. If you were to divide the string into division of four, you get the next harmonic, another C, two octaves higher. This is what Pythagoras was experimenting with, and this is where he got to. The little he knew that this actually happens if you go on to infinity, dividing the string into four equal parts, five equal parts, six, seven, and so on and so forth, forever and ever and ever. And this ratio is always the same. This formula is always the same. Whether you're uh, starting on C as fundamental frequency, C sharp, D, or any other note. And this spacing will always be the same. So this is basically what it will look like, division of one. And these are, for example, if you look at uh, the second and third column from the left, C and G, divisions of two and division of three, Remember earlier I said that a fifth, which is the distance between C and G, mm -hmm. because it's C, D, E, F, G, one, two, three, four, five, for those mm -hmm. of you who have not studied music, um, that's a three to two ratio. Where do we get that from? Divisions of three, 
over the division of 2, 3 to 2. A fourth, the distance between G and C, that's a 4 to 3 ratio. A third, C to E, that's a 5 to 4 ratio, and so on. See mm -hmm. where the math comes from. Mm -hmm. So this is basically um, a very short video. This is the harmonic spectrum of one of my Himalayan singing bowls. Mm -hmm. What you're looking at is um, left and right channel. This is why they look alike, uh, bottom and top. And uh, first, when I press play, you're going to hear the Himalayan singing bowl sound as it sounds the way you strike it. And then you're going to see the cursor focusing on the first harmonic from the bottom, which is the horizontal line. These are all the notes that are contained in the sound of the bowl, basically, where you will hear one harmonic at a time, and you hear and see this cursor moving from the lowest horizontal line and going higher to the higher one. And at the end, you hear everything all together. Okay? okay. So listen attentively. Maybe um, raise the volume on your computers uh, for people who are attending because the higher harmonics are very light and uh, barely audible. Here we go. So these are all the harmonics that are contained in, in one bowl. Hmm. And there is something magical in the harmonic overtone series. This is why um, similar instruments or harmonic overtone producing instruments such as Himalayan singing bowls, gongs, discs, bells, didgeridoos, overtone singing, all sorts of instruments that emit harmonic overtones to a clearly audible level. Very important, because the harmonics are in every sound, every sound in nature, human-made instrument, voices. But the value is that when they're being played and heard, clearly heard, these instruments have always been used in sound therapy or the field of sound healing. I avoid using this term because it's gimmicky, really. So uh, basically, uh, there's something in, is being exemplified in the sound of such instrument. When we play such an instrument, it is modeling to us what being in resonance is like, to be like. Mm. It's giving us the mathematical ratios that create the universe. This is the mystery of sound. Of course, I'm telling you the very beginning of it. And it goes a lot, a lot, a lot deeper. You right. ask a big question, what is the sound? What is, you know, why the word? Why music of the sphere? So this is what is being talked about. This is what Plato was trying to communicate. This is why so many uh, uh, luminaries and researchers and, and scholars, after having done a lot of digging, they get to sound at the end. Mm -hmm. So... These are the harmonic overtones in Shruti Box. Shruti Box is a small instrument that's kind of a uh, modified version, very basic version of a harmonium. It doesn't have, does not have the keyboard. It's just like a bellow box that you bellow in air into it, and you have vibrating reeds inside. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to play um, uh, this. This is all found within C note. All of these horizontal lines are harmonics within one note. You won't hear all of them. You'll hear only two or three at best. It sounds like this. So this, these are the harmonic overtones in a gong, 38-inch symphonic, uh, symphonic gong. Um, so this is what the gong sounds like. So what do they do to consciousness? Well, these are some EEG studies that I've done, just show a couple of slides. This is baseline brain. On the left, there's the left hemisphere. On the right, the right hemisphere. 
uh, going deep into it, that's, that's times, about six seconds. The blue is no electrical activity, green a little more electrical activity because thoughts are electrical activities and chemicals. And then you have red, yellow, and white. On the bottom, you have the brainwave cycles where you see 0, 20, 60, 80, 100. This is basically hertz, the hertz level, the cycles per second. So this is a busy mind. My subject is laying down, wearing a mask, not listening to anything, but apparently there are a lot of thoughts in her mind, in her mm -hmm. brain. Mm -hmm. And this is what happens when a large gong is being played at loud dynamics. Mm -hmm. Everything flattens. No more monkey mind. So basically, that's what happens when you listen to fifth. Fifth is a very powerful interval, C to G, played on tuning forks. So, yeah, we we talked about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's basically, in short, <laughs> to answer your question. <laughs> but um, yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you so much. I, I, I got to say, you know, it's notable to me just how soothing I found the image of that EEG as you were showing the, the lines smoothed out by the gong. I felt smoothed out. <laughs> right. Uh, and just to actually see that displayed uh, in that fashion is also just gives me such pause. And uh, yeah, I'm once again in awe of the power of of sound yeah. yeah absolutely that's this is why music is powerful people don't know i yeah. mean it's the beginning of what we can do with sound yeah yeah so given it's a little bit after nine o'clock now i would like to open it up to our participants to offer some questions and, and some q a here sure yeah yeah thanks so much to both of you. Thanks, Alexandra, as always. You're welcome, Henrietta. It was amazing. I mean, I have so much I want to say. <laughs> I'm going to pass it over to the participants <laughs> and their questions. And then mm. if I can get a quick question of my own at the end, I will. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's go to um, Matt was the first um, the first person who asked a question. <coughs> Anyone who has studied music has probably heard the old expression, music as a language. But from my perspective, and it seems Alexandra might agree, this might be backwards. Language actually fits into the larger spectrum that is music. Would you <laughs> please comment on this notion? I mean, I think you've been commenting on that. Yes. Before. Yeah, well, absolutely. Way of putting it. Yeah. yeah. Um, they're inextricably linked. They cannot be separated. Um, language is sound. Sound is involved in language, but it's not. My message here is that language is not just words to, to get meaning out of. But it's more than that. There is music to the way uh, words, phrases are packaged, or the setting. Huh? When you, when you're a songwriter or composer, and you are composing music to to poetry or songwriting. Uh, that is called setting poetry to music or setting text to music. We're always doing this as we're talking. And we need to become more aware and involved, paying more attention to what we're doing, what kind of music we're setting, and to listen to it when someone else is talking to us, not to leave the musical aspect out. Hmm. Yeah. I, de I defer to Alexandra. <laughs> <laughs> so what he said. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I just wanted to quickly comment on what you were saying, Dan, about <clears throat> this sort of, well, one technology, but also the clunky set of tools mm. you use description. Just, I mean, it's just interesting to wonder continually about the effect of technology and how we use it and Alexandra's comments on text and, you know, that form of communication. I mean, 
you know, I grew, we I think we all grew up in an era before that, right? Well, yeah. Alex and I did, and I did as I'm well. very grateful for that. I grew up with birdsong, hmm. um, poetry, and music, and and those things are the things that keep me personally sane mm -hmm. still, mm -hmm. you know, and not not the other nothing at not certainly not the email world, even though it's useful. It is not. It's not on a high vibration mm. maybe in that way of communication. So we'll go to a, a question by Michelle from Michelle. Mm. Michelle, if you're out there, actually, do you want to come on and talk? She quite often likes to come on and join in. So if she's there, that would be great. Um, actually, while we're waiting for her, I will go to Barbara. Mm -hmm. uh, Barbara, who's joined us for the first time this evening. So that's nice to have you here, Barbara. Was, Welcome. Uh, earlier, yeah. Mm. She joined the course late, so. Nice. She says, I don't know how to ask this, but is it synesthesia that somehow partially accounts for the felt connection between the present and a past life, the crossing over that somehow unites the meaning of a past life with a present one during a regression? Can synesthesia serve as a bridge between timelines? And she says, she adds, I hope that makes sense. It, it does to me, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Alexander, would you like to speak to that? Um, it's hard for me, because uh, I've, I've never had uh, any experience with past life regression and um, trying to imagine if this would be applicable. Yeah. Uh, if I may. Yeah, please. May. What, why don't you start and I'll see if I, if I have anything to say. Certainly, certainly. I, I mean, I think it's a fascinating question and a fascinating phrasing of the question because there may be, and this is where you may have some insight, Alexandra. Um, there may be a series of synesthesias that are happening in the present moment that are connecting what feels like emotions from the past, the future, and any other number of places that are converging in that present moment and adding up to the narrative and the experience that is emerging for the person there. So I would say that I don't know that synesthesia is the correct word in this case although you know that piece that synesthesia does speak to the overlapping of sensory experiences in that way um, I do feel that there is certainly an overlapping taking place of not only sensory experiences but many, many other things in the experience of past life regression where it is uh, applicable and it isn't necessarily the wrong word um, but there it's it's just it seems to be speaking to me to a smaller piece of what's happening in the larger experience so if uh i don't see the question i want to read it again just to make yeah. sure i'm clear can synesthesia serve as a bridge between timelines to answer that specific question uh, synesthesia can be used in induction and can be used in the experience <laughs> past life regression, moving one through the experience. And in that way, yes, it can be used and serve as a bridge. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Great. Yeah, well, um, yeah, I, I don't think, I don't have anything to add to it, but <laughs> I, I would agree with you. <laughs> yeah. You know, when uh, earlier, Alexandra, you used the word extemporaneous, you know, uh -huh. that, that's what, Daniel made me think about then that it's really beyond what what's happening in that process in past life regression is is actually a mystery really. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, there are many tremendous uh, aspects of it. Yes, that are deeply mysterious. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and synesthesia will happen and can happen many times over the course of one past life regression. So it is there. It's in the ingredients of the experience for some, not all. Uh, but it, yeah, it's, it's such an interesting question. Um, 
because it's not the main ingredient. You know, if it were an ice cream sundae, this would be the hot fudge or something. It wouldn't be the ice cream itself. Um, so it, it's interesting, and it's something I'm going to give more thought to. Mm. So thank you, Barbara. Yeah, thanks, Barbara. Yeah, thank you. Good question. Mm -hmm. um, so Michelle will come on and join us. If you're out there, Michelle, I'll pass it over to you. Here she is. Uh, hold on. Hello. Can you Hi, see Michelle. me? So as always, you guys take me all over the place <laughs> and um, I have more questions than I think that I could even put out at this moment, but to kind of address the healing with sound, um, I come from a shamanic hybrid tradition called the Santo Daimi, and we um, sing um, as part and is actually central to the whole expression of the religion. And um, these are called hymns and they are received. Um, I have received them, they come almost complete. Um, and so they, the, the idea that we have, uh, the best understanding that we have about what these hymns are, is that they are beings that come into the work in the presence of being sung into, being invoked. Um, and they come and do work for that moment and then they move on. Um, and then they have whole, we have whole tradi we have whole subsets of hymns that are just for healing. Um, and so having come from that tradition, I have been fascinated with sound and healing and really kind of the physics of collapsing waveforms. <laughs> um, mm. Since I do regularly receive um, reoccurring visions and uh, channelings about the Ohm and the Big Bang and the sound that we are, the waveform that we are within right now in our universal expression um, and really how little we know and how much, um, how, how tantalizing that is mm. <laughs> to know that we don't know it all. <laughs> mm. So just thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to put that out there about singing and I grew up uh, as a polyglot as well and, and as one that receives visions, it is incredibly difficult to describe something that comes to you in such a holistic form. Uh, how do you start to describe something that comes complete? And the moment you start to describe it, you are defining it and limiting it. So, you know, the, the power of language to mold um, has pros and cons. Mm. So <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Alexander, I actually have another question I'd, I'd like to ask you. Please. Uh, we've spoken a little bit before about uh, certain aspects of both of our respective fields and healing and therapy in general and certain language that we find, uh, usually marketing language, that we find creating more problems for practitioners and consumers alike uh, than, you know, solving them. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always found you to be a very articulate and passionate voice uh, in exploring those aspects of these fields which create those problems. Um, so I'd like to talk and hear you talk a little bit tonight about what you see in the field that's creating confusion for us as practitioners and consumers. Um, you, you broke a couple of places uh, in, in the field of, I'm sorry, I'm, I may have missed a few Oh, pardon think? me. Yeah, quite all right. Uh, so the question was: uh, We've spoken before about our in our respective fields there being certain troublesome language. Oh right, yes. Mostly in the marketing end. Yes. Oh, absolutely. That confuses us as consumers and practitioners, and yeah. creates yeah. more problems than it solves. Uh, and I'd I'd love to hear you speak on this as you're particular particularly articulate <laughs> about it. So if you yeah. would please tell us a little bit about what you see as the problems in these fields currently. Yeah. Yes. Um, so this is my personal opinion, mm. but uh, and and unfortunately I'm 
one of very, very few people who address these things, and I think there should be more. Um, and I have to say this in advance that I talk about them not just because I'm opinionated or I'm criticizing people. No, I'm bringing awareness. And um, I'm looking for an amelioration here in bringing awareness to how we're handling things. And to, to, this is to the benefit of humanity and not just me. Uh, fortunately, I've had to voice it out because no one else is voicing this out. Uh, for example, uh, this, the way we in the West are handling spirituality and shamanism, very often we get the watered down version of it and the commercial version, the um, pop version, mm -hmm. and they become commodities, they become a fad, they become oh, this is what's hot now, you know. Well, also, there is this obsession with uh, the healer. I'm a healer, I'm a healer. No, no you, you don't. I mean, I'm sorry. Healers do not directly heal people. My definition of a healer, and I do this work, have been doing it for many years, and I don't call myself a healer, unless everyone agrees that the definition of a healer is someone who helps people heal themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's different. Mm -hmm. yes. we're not healing people and I know people are coming from a good place they want to feel good about themselves they want to feel that they're doing something positive to others but they're not realizing that not being careful with such words and titles would make them ruin that first thing that they're working on instead of empowering the person self-empowerment is part of the healing instead of bringing awareness that for this person who is coming to work with us, if we tell them, oh, you're coming here, or I'm a healer, I'm going to heal you. It's like going and paying a doctor's visit. You know, check me out. I, 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 something is wrong with me. Uh, examine me. Give me medication. Um, I can't do anything. Um, I'm busy, so give me some medication that would fix it. Uh, that's basically where we come from, and we're bringing that paradigm into this realm, a new realm, the archaic methods, the wonderful archaic methods that are being revived. Spirituality, uh, holistic practices, shamanism, and we are treating them in the same toxic and nonsensical way that we treat uh, things in the West, you know, especially in the medical field. We, healers don't heal others. I've never met one healer who has healed someone in a direct way. Maybe they do exist. I have not met a healer who heals without the other person is doing something without placebos being involved or something. But I've, I've done field work in over 40 countries. I've been around for a while and I've been in adventurous places and, 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 and unique situations and ceremonies. Um, this is totally wrong. This is totally wrong. This is a deception. This is a Western approach to healing. A master, people becoming masters over a weekend. You know, Reiki master in two days. Wait a second. My understanding of a master means, you know, taking many years to get there. And mm -hmm. probably when the person gets to that level, the person would not call him or herself a master mm -hmm. because they know that there's no such thing, that we're always learning. We're only serious, dedicated apprentices. Mm -hmm. You know, you become a gong master in a week. Like, <laughs> These are certificates for ego inflation. Hmm. Permission for ego inflation. Mm -hmm. People are starting to run after such a certificate. They're not realizing that they are hindering their own process. Those who are uh, giving out uh, these programs, training thousands of yoga teachers without giving them enough of hours to be trained, to to train them on various aspects or Reiki healers, Reiki practitioners. How about that? Isn't that better? Mm -hmm. Do we need to become right away master? Mm. You know, let's not find creative and non-creative ways to celebrate mediocrity. This is happening left and right to a level where everybody is accepting that. Everybody knows that it's a joke, but it's accepting it and they're seeking that mastership. Mm. 
that healer certification, you know, that's nonsense and BS, total BS. And we need to wake up to it. Someone has to do something about it. Definitely not those who have these schools because they use these terms to lure in more people, to seduce more people. And guess what? There's a deception there <clears throat> where people, when they don't realize that they're not doing their own work in the best way, that uh, d doing work with these powerful tools, whether we're talking about shamanism or holistic practices and anything in the realm of spirituality, which is nauseatingly pop level at best, you know, there are so many hindrances involved. Ego inflation is on top of the list. Spiritual materialism is another one. Mm. Spiritual bypassing and having messianic visions to, you know, people drink ayahuasca one time and they want to end wars and feed the poor and, 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 you know, house the homeless and do all these big plans. Like, wait a second, just keep working on yourself. Keep healing yourself. You're doing good work, but don't let it get to your head. But these are powerful tools that people don't realize that they can backfire on the individual if the individual is not aware. Mm -hmm. So uh, we need to find a better way to deal with uh, spirituality in the West than the way we're dealing because the static score is horrible. Mm -hmm. And some people say, well, you know, we have to start somewhere, you know, we're eventually. Yes, but with more awareness, we meander a lot less and we take people on bad trips a lot less. Mm -hmm. And we chip you know, people left and right a lot, lot less if we have this awareness. And nobody seems to be saying anything. Shamans are sprouting left and right and gurus, you know, we haven't learned anything from what we did with gurus in, in the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. And now it's the shaman's uh, turn, you know, and then these people are human beings. They have good intentions, but when we're not careful, we can set them up. And it's us that are responsible, not them, not always them. Most of them operate with good intention. Some have bad intention, but they really mean well. But when you subject a person with ego trials and with nauseating level of devotions and, and religiousness and all of this stuff, then it becomes a cult, then it becomes dogmatic. Mm. And we're not being super careful all of us interested in this. Some are more aware than others. And then the shaman goes rogue or the guru goes rogue. And then we start saying, oh, what a deception. Who caused this? Let's, let's have a dialogue about all of this. I'm not hearing enough of a dialogue. Yeah. yeah. I, I can rant for hours about this, but you know, I think I made my point. Yeah. Well, yes. Well, I love it. Thank you for your passion. Um, I agree. There isn't uh, enough of a conversation on this. And your your point, your salient point is uh, well made that it's their work that suffers. It's, it's, you know, it's the work one's doing on themselves that's lacking there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, beautiful. Thank you. I believe I see another question from Barbara. Yes. And she's with us too. So ah, Barbara great. If you turn on your microphone, Barbara, by unmuting yourself, can you see that symbol bottom left of your screen that says mute or unmute? That's there okay. It is. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I actually, um, it's fascinating, and I love what Alexandra just said about shamans because the woman who helped me the most actually called herself a facilitator. Uh -huh. and That's I, a much better word. Yeah, because I think it is disempowering to present yourself as a healer. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm here to heal you. So anyway, I, one reason I loved working with Tibetan singing bowls as a healing tool is because it was almost like once the session began, you were on your own. It was your own experience. It was almost like, you know, the so-called healer disappeared. So my experience, I'm just trying to find where my note was. Um, Cause suddenly I wasn't expecting you to come on. I thought it was going to be over. Um, what I found, he had different bowls attuned to different chakras. So hmm. it seemed like he could force you kind of into a, 
whatever your disharmony was, say, say you have victim consciousness or you were raped or whatever, that's stored somewhere in you. And by playing these incredibly harmonious overtones, it seemed like it would force that out, almost like a toxin out of the body. Mm -hmm. and, and that picture that you showed where everything was flattened out in the mind, it, you, I would go into the state, which I would really say was like journeying. It was completely like journeying. Mm -hmm. And you know, I would go back into whatever happened that was traumatic. So I just wondered if, you know, maybe Alexandra or Daniel or one of you wanted to comment on that further, that sound can induce <laughs> journeying like experience. Yeah. Please, Alexandra. Okay. Well, you know, so that's another thing I mentioned earlier that I don't promote the use of the term sound healing or sound healer. Mm -hmm. It's a gimmicky term. It's another BS term. I don't know who coined it. It should be abolished. And there are many other terms that could be used that are more descriptive. Uh, sound therapy, sound meditation, sound journeying. I use sound therapy and sound meditation. I did not coin them. I'm not the first one or the last one to use them. Hopefully there'll be more. So yeah, people don't heal others with sound. What happens when we listen to them, yeah, it's the facilitator, better term, plays these instruments, and there is a certain way of playing them. Um, and one needs to know a lot. That's why one cannot become a sound healer over a weekend or over a week or even over one year for that matter. Mm -hmm. um, what happens, basically, there's a certain way of listening to these overtones. Sound healers, don't talk to people. Don't tell them how to listen. They just start playing. Mm -hmm. There's a specific way of listening. This is the most important thing in the experience. What to do with the sound, how to journey with it, how to focus the mind on it, to stop mm -hmm. the discursive thinking, how to do psychonautic work. Um, so um, but basically, in short, without going over for, for an hour about this, uh, sound, the sound of the bowl, giving us the mathematics of sound, which is built in in us. This ratio is also within us. We vibrate sympathetically. The microtubules in brain neurons vibrate sympathetically with enharmonic sound. People can look into Hameroff's uh, study, Hameroff, H-A-M-E-R-O-F-F, -F, uh, about microtubules. Uh, and the way they respond to such sound. We are designed to vibrate sympathetically, to snap back into grid. Mm -hmm. uh, when we listen to sound with the mathematics of nature, true harmony, the true harmony that we're no longer connected to because sound in the West is disempowered, castrated, literally. That's what the equal temperament is. Mm -hmm. There's a great book about this called how equal temperament ruined harmony and why you should care. Wow. Uh, yeah. So, um, so basically when we listen to the sound of a bowl or gong and listen attentively, judiciously, we are listening to the source code of the universe, which is also us built in, in us as, as a way to correct any deviation, to release stress, to mm. purge dissonance, to, mm allow things to snap back into grid that's in short what happens now as far as the notes correlating to chakras this is unconfirmed rumor there are i know probably your facilitator said this on good faith but uh, there are a lot of things that sound practitioners don't know and they end up by circulating wrong information with good intention they don't realize this but there's so much to know for any sound practitioner. And there are, there are a lot of hooey and hokey stuff and unconfirmed rumors and wishful thinking in sound that people end up by circulating without having any bad intention because there is no one institution that teaches you all of these things. I mean, I lead the program at the Open Center. This is one of two major institutions in, in the US. Uh, it's, and it's a 120 hour long program and that's nothing compared to what it needs to be. Um, 
so there is no standardization there you know there's this there's no this is, topic is not being taken seriously people are not being trained thoroughly trained in many different aspects so they think that the seven notes in the scale correlate to chakra notes that's an unconfirmed rumor there's no evidence of that yes there i've heard that coming from various sources the indian system differs from the tibetan system every time you hear two different stories or more that means don't believe any of them uh, try to figure out what is being talked about here so sound can affect i don't use notes correlating to chakras but sound is very effective on the brainwave activities on the vagus nerve on heart rate variability we know it's affecting or must be affecting subtle energy we don't know how and how to measure it whether that be chakras kundalini prana or chi yeah yeah um i my question about um Oh gosh, I'm still trying to find it because I was listening to you, so I didn't find it. But um, my question about the um, synesthesia was that, I mean, I, I meditate and actually my particular meditation has something in it called the sound. So all I can tell you is as I meditate through these techniques, I become, it's almost like all the different levels of me become as, as one. And so I kind of feel like in that question about, um, past life regression and the relation between say past life regression and the journeying or the experience that you were addressing with the Tibetan bowls. It, it induces, I don't know, like a, a, a state of unity that seems to release you from your mind where you can connect up with other dimensions, you know? And so I wondered if past life regression, I'm trying to tie those two together. So mm -hmm. what you said was great, but may I, can anyone follow up on that? <laughs> well, what you say about the, the singing bowl creating in you a feeling of absolute unity, uh, I, I feel like Alexander has spoken to that, you know, in 10 different ways tonight. I, and I can certainly think of my own experience in similar fashion, Barbara, but I, which I have had with singing bowls as well. So I think that that unity that is created in that, which Alexandra understands the, the audio of better than any of us, um, but as that, as that happens in us internally, I think a context is created for a multiplicity of experiences to occur, whether it's visions of what may or may not be past lifetimes or, or alternate universes or past or future or any number of things. I think what, what, what really struck me when Alexandra was talking about synesthesia was it united two senses. And, yeah. and kind of when you unite anything, it becomes a fuller dimension. It's more whole. It's closer to oneness. And I was wondering is what makes past life regression like a real experience to you? And, and forgive me because I haven't heard the sessions before this. But, you know, I was wondering if it's, it's sort of based on that same principle of synesthesia that it's uniting some felt sense then with now and it's the uniting of it that makes it real for you does that make sense yeah and it's another very interesting way of phrasing the question um and you know to be clear the real experience uh, alexander having mentioned before reality is an internal experience and robert lanza's book biocentrism I, I think the real experience happens in the present period mm. and that what's occurring the experiences themselves, while we may perceive them as coming from the past, we are in the, the present with these experiences. The emotions are happening now, the thoughts are happening now, the physiology is happening now. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the nature of time in this exercise is one of the very mysterious aspects of it. Yeah, yeah. But it's incredible, like you said, because you're feeling it in the present, basically. That's what yes. makes it incredible. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you mm -hmm. both. I'm just starting to delve into this. So much of what he said about sound just reinforces my own, you know, understanding that listening is really like speaking and it's a lost art. And mm -hmm. anyone who's trying to do any kind of communication, whether it's therapy or teaching, has to actually focus on that much more than, mm -hmm. than we're trying to do, basically. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. 
Yeah, you're welcome. The harmonic series is the living God. That's what's been called in my friend Howard. I was mentioning his name earlier. Uh, you guys should check out his books, Howard Berry Shots. Um, he was able to decode um, the book of creation, the only book written by Abraham, the patriarch. Mm. <clears throat> and his conclusion is that uh, the harmonic series is the living God. This is the stairway to heaven in the esoteric philosophies. This is the, the force, the unique force in the universe. So when we're subjected to that, we almost step outside of the human experience. We go into transcendental state where we become everything and nothing. And there seem to be ways to navigate in that realm. Mm. One can do things and not just witness it in meditation. Mm. Yeah. So there are a lot of psychonautic skills that one can learn. <clears throat> psychonautic skills if people are not... Um, uh, aware of this term, astronaut of the psyche, <laughs> psychonaut. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what we do when we meditate or we journey in various ways. There's a way of navigating instead of just witnessing that. Mm -hmm. That's a great word. Yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah. any more questions from our participants? <coughs> no. Um, we you we have spoken to Michelle and Barbara and then the other two. No, so that's that's it. Beautiful. Well, I'd like to thank everybody participating tonight and thank you so so much for your time this evening, Alexandra. It's been wonderful speaking with you, wholly thank enriching, you. and uh, look forward thank to the you. future. Pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it was wonderful. Thank you, Daniel, for the invitation, and Henrietta yeah. for facilitating, and Kelly. Yeah for uh, conducting things. Yes, thank yeah. you, Henrietta. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Evolver. Thank you to, yeah, thank you to both of you. Alexandra, I want to take you up on your rant. Well, you have, <laughs> I think you should rant more. I mean, in a, in a good way. Agreed, yeah. I, I second that. <clears throat> People, everybody needs to rant. No one needs to, but the problem here is that I'm not the only person who notices, I know others notice, but they don't say anything because they don't want to be judgmental. But this is not about being judgmental, you see? Uh, it, it's, uh, you can't let people do what they're doing because they're not aware. They're doing this because they're not aware. They don't know enough. Hmm. And compassion, as Trungpa said, compassion is not always about being kind. It's about being imaginative and creative enough to wake up a person. Hmm. Absolutely. No, I fully <coughs> don't agree with you that these things need to be said because we're in a dangerous situation, I think. Very yeah. passionate. What you said, I, I second wholly. I mean, that's my kind of... And there's, there's a lot of narcissism and inauthenticity. These are the problems. This is what we end up by dealing with as a result. Narcissism, extreme narcissism and inauthenticity, lack of sincerity and lack of integrity. And it becomes a widely acceptable thing that everyone else well, copies. Well, that is the culture we're living in. That's the problem. How, yes. do we, how do we grow out of that? And, you know, it's hard work. But, Awareness. You know, yes, hard work. It does not come the easy way. No, no, no. It's, it's going to be very hard work. Yeah. <coughs> um, yeah. This, this I, should uh, be the topic of a future series. I would just like I've to... I've thought like, about it quite a lot, yes. You know, a forum, a panel... <laughs> Yeah. I've thought about it all the time, and actually, it's this is a conversation that really needs to be had. Indeed. Yeah, all, all I, I talk about it all the time in every course I teach at the Open Center, all the time, because you you, people have to know, have to be aware that, yeah, oh, that's right. You know, this shouldn't happen. That's not good for anyone. Right. And yeah. we can say something. <laughs> Alexander, what kind of responses do you receive? Always in other... positive, always positive. No one right. yet, and fortunately. And I always tell people that I have nothing to do with this. I don't enjoy doing this, but I'm saying it because no one else is saying it. Mm. No one else is acknowledging what's happening. Everyone is being polite and accepting. But that's not about being kind. It's not about, you know, can't let people do this. Can't watch this and not say anything. Mm -hmm. Commercializing, watering down fantastic thing and becoming commodities and you know just pop level everything 
Totally. Well, that is the culture we live in. And, and mm. we. And it doesn't have to be like that. We need to learn. No, no, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. A hundred percent. And um, I, I know it's very strong in America. That's nothing. I mean, it is everywhere. <laughs> but it's very strong in America. Yeah. I, I don't know why that is. Perhaps because it's a younger culture, more susceptible. I, I mean, not, that's not a negative comment, just an observation of mine. You know, sure. I have in Europe and traveled a lot. It was that, you know, people are more sort of hungry and, and so they take things, you know, quickly and then want to, to embody something that they haven't actually. There are many causes why it's happening, you know, sure. because people are busy, they're distracted. Uh, they don't have the time, or the energy, or the willingness to go deep into things. So the one-on-one -on -one level serves many people. And that's what the media uses to package things. But guess what? You know, if the establishment is uh, practicing any mind control tactics, one way to do that is to, to control the opposition is to lead it. Yes. Go on. To lead the opposition. Mm. And you lead it by commercializing these things so that they become ineffective. They don't need to spend so much effort on leading it. We're doing a pretty darn bad job. <laughs> yeah. well, Alexander, just so you know, I'm going to start being more vocal about it. As you say, Thank nobody's you. talking about it. I'm going to start talking about it. And I'm going to be in touch with you down the road. And we'll continue the conversation on it. Because that would be great. I agree. That would yeah. be great. And I'll, I'll help you do any kind of... <laughs> All right, let's, the, the conversation started here then, right now. Yeah. Let's, let's remember this a couple of years from now. I've got to, can I just say one thing? I know Please. it's your webinar, but I, because I'm, I've been working very much on these webinars and particularly yours, Daniel, just because I was trying an experiment of using my intuition of things coming up. And I, you know, if something comes up very strongly, I want to act on it. So I, I was compelled with the conversation between you and Alexandra at the beginning to go and get this book, which is a, a book by Sri Aurobindo called mm -hmm. um, Mother or the Divine Materialism. And I, I just sort of said, well, what, you know, whatever page, I'm just gonna open it on a page and I'm gonna pay attention to it because I, this book is that way for me. And, and I opened it here and read here and it said, um, Mother, who's the sort of, luminary mother suddenly said to us i don't know how i can help you but i'm going to send you some music and indeed it came like a very vast rhythm which was perhaps music and it raimented itself in words as it descended it chose its words automatically as if the sound created the word or attracted its own like word but but were there the least thought the sound was blurred and all the words came out wrong Thought automatically took form at a lower level, almost unknowingly, as if it had been produced by the music, a secondary and inferior effect of the music. If the rhythm were lost, the thought was also lost. Mm. Probably because thought, like all the rest, like our architecture, our painting, our gestures, and our revolutions, is simply an expression of this great flow of the Shakti, which is the rhythm of everything. If we always knew how to find the pure flow, how wonderful it would be to create is to rediscover the great music, to tune into the pure rhythm and let it flow. But most of the time we only tune into our ideas. We translate everything through our opaque mental sargasso. So naturally the rhythm becomes false, the thought becomes false and all life becomes false. It is no longer the movement of great wings. It is the movement of anything at all that fidgets and bangs against all the bars of its cage. If only I had an orchestra of 200 performers at my disposal, a kind of meditation with sounds. <laughs> mm, beautiful. Beautiful. Right? <laughs> Gorgeous. Excellent. Just a good way to end. I think yes. so. A, a perfect note to end on, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. thank you both so much. A, a wonderful session and to be uh, built upon in yeah. the future. Yeah. Thank you Thanks. very much. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you, Henrietta. Thank, Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, everyone. Next Thank week. you. We'll all be in touch. Yes. Very good. All right. Good night.